Hey, all right, everyone. Before we get into today's show, I want to talk about my Birch mattress. This has been what? Maybe four or five weeks I've been sleeping on it and it's been incredible. It's firm yet soft enough that I'm comfortable. My bones feel good. My body feels good. And it's helping me sleep better at night, which is really, really important because you hear me talk about sleep. You hear me talk about how that translates into your brain energy during the day, your mitochondrial energy during the day, restoration, immune health. It's everything. And if we're not sleeping properly on a really crappy bed, that's one thing. But then add into that those toxins, right? Those off-gassing toxins that we have in conventional beds, they can really take a toll on our health. Now, we may not feel it immediately, but we feel it over time when diseases start popping up left and right as we age and get older. All right, so Birch is a premium mattress in a box company. It's really chic and beautiful, but it's very, very comfortable. And most importantly to me, environmentally conscious and non-toxic. So it's so essential. One of the main things that I preach to people to really, really make an intervention in their home is their mattress. It will give you the biggest bang for the buck. It's an investment, yes, but it's a long-term health investment. So another plus about Birch is that they have several third-party certifications. Remember, third-party certifications are non-biased and we get to know that, yeah, it's living up to par. So these are listed on the page on their website never leaves you guessing. It's putting it out there right for you, which is amazing stuff. And that's a transparency that we love bringing into our show and working. With your Birch mattress, you're going to get two EcoRest pillows. They're actually made from recycled bottles, which is amazing, but they're very breathable. So I find when I'm sleeping on these pillows, I sweat a lot less. And it's really important to keep your body cool, your core body temperature cool when you're sleeping because it's allowing you to get into deeper REM sleep. So you're also going to get a 100 night sleep trial and a 10 year warranty. So if you're hesitant about buying it and something you never tried, there's no worries because Birch is going to have you covered on this. So I want you to click the link below or go to birchliving.com slash heal thyself. You're going to get $400 just by that code, $400 off of your first mattress and you're going to get two free pillows. All right, before we get to this knowledge bomb, I just want to tell you about my Verizon in the know product, which has been so amazing for me, this Prima bath gem. Now you'll remember Jessica Asaf has been on the show and she is the co-founder of Prima and they use really, really, really high quality ingredients. She is such a stickler for everything that goes into her product. This particular bath bomb is a bestseller. It's made of CBD, Epsom salt, and soothing metal foam and camphor oils. For me, it's the best way to relax and unwind. It's a triple threat because it relaxes the whole body, helps support your sleep, and that's when I do it right before bed. And if you feel your skin after, you're gonna feel it super silky smooth. And it's called a day at the spa at home. The price on this is 16 bucks. It's a perfect gift for anyone who loves bath bombs, right? I put this into any of the gift bags that I make for people, organic, therapeutic, and it feels like you just take a deep breath. I really want you to experience it all because the only way I can describe it is like, I put on this bath, I've done Epsom salt baths, but I put on this bath bomb and it just has this like aroma and it's a CBD working with the Epsom. So the magnesium you get in your body, the CBD, you're getting the relaxing effect and then the oils are leaving your skin feeling really good. So it does actually feel like you're in a spa, but it's awesome after a long day of work, after a workout, certainly. And if you're feeling any like tension or stress in your body, here's an opportunity to take a bath bomb. Do it before bed and you'll sleep better. I promise you, just watch. So it's the best uh, startup product for anyone interested in exploring uh, CBD. And again, high quality ingredients, hypoallergenic, vegan, cruelty-free, gluten-free, and it's consciously formulated. No synthetic fragrances, of course. No mineral oil, right, from crude oil. PEG, sulfates, parabens, phthalates, or any chemicals that you need to worry about. I'm such a fan of this bath bomb. Try it out. DM me, let me know how it goes. So if you want this product, there's gonna be a link in the description. You can scan the QR code, or you can go to inthenow.com slash heal thyself, and you can purchase this. I'm Dr. G, and for the past 10 years of my life, I've been passionate about all things holistic healing. 
I've been committed to healing myself and others from the inside out by incorporating some of the most effective modalities for healing the mental, the emotional, and the physical, I've learned that they give us the opportunity to be our most authentic and powerful selves. Heal Thyself is a show dedicated to just that. Today's show is going to be incredible, and I say it every week, of course I do, because it is incredible. Knowledge bombs of digestible information to empower and create clarity on what the highest version of us looks like. Product reviews to provide informed consent so you can buy the safest and best products out there. Better than the first two that I spoke about and you're getting other B vitamins, which are energizing, right? Get off of it, throw it away. And special guest segments with some of the brightest and most elite minds in their field. So what is that like on my nervous system? Six hours of holding that emotion. Here's the earth, here's the mechanisms and mechanics of an earth when it breathes. We would think much different about that asthma patient that shows up. All to create change in all the parts that make you, you, so we can start healing ourselves and each other. All right, everyone, welcome to today's episode of Heal Thyself. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, showing up, whether today or you've been doing it since episode one, I thank you. I give you so much gratitude. Today's show, a very special one. I'm going to be going into something that's so, so, so important. Actually, today's going to be one of the first episodes, the first episode where I have no outline. I have no plan. I'm just going to speak from my heart and talk about things that have been very important to me and my healing uh, and how it has changed my life. And hopefully you all resonate and it can lay the primer for you to change your life and your health. So it's going to be really, really important knowledge bomb about somewhat getting to know Dr. G, this avatar that I have, and, and also me just opening up about what's been the best healing for me and how we can all heal ourselves. The show is called Heal Thyself. So I want to share my Heal Thyself journey. And we have a super special guest, Dr. Zaki of the Breathe Institute, one of the world renowned foremost authorities on breathing, particularly when you're sleeping, but really how mouth breathing can affect your health from childhood to being an adult. So he's going to go into everything about how to properly breathe, where our tongue's supposed to be, how to properly swallow, how to properly chew, and how to recognize this in your children early on so you're able to make an intervention. So not only are they breathing better, they're actually changing the way they develop their face, their jaw, their posture. You can do this intervention from early on. So he's going to drop so many, so many bombs. I'm really, 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 really excited to talk to him. I've actually worked with him before. So it's going to be a real big honor to have him here. So uh, without further ado, let's get to this knowledge bomb. All right, everyone. So today's knowledge bomb is a very, very special knowledge bomb because I just want, I want to let you know how this show goes. You know, I'll, I'll usually think of a really important topic that has to do around health, whether mental, emotional, spiritual, and of course, physical. And um, I'll look at studies. Um, uh, I'll put together all of my ideas about how I want to present it. And I'll put some bullet points on a uh, laptop and then it'll be reflected back on me. Um, through this beautiful device that I see in front of me. And I'm able to just be in flow with the information that I want to give you all. But today uh, is a, an opportunity for me to really, really show up and speak from the heart. And uh, one thing in particular that's been difficult for me as not only a practitioner, but just as a human being, right? And friendship and loverships and family has been the concept of what it really means to open up and what it really means to show up authentically. I've had so many experts come in here and I spoke about myself, what authenticity is. And if you remember, or if you go back to Dr. Omid Naim, he spoke about this concept uh, initially and it was echoed and amplified by Dr. Mary Pardee in one of my recent episodes with her. But really it's this, I want you to think about yourself as a child and how explorative we were about the world and how in awe we were about the world. And it's really those ages from one to seven where you're developing your experience, right? So you see a rose for the first time and you're in awe of it. It's beautiful. And you don't say the word rose because you may not even have that in your vocabulary yet. You may not even have ever learned the word, but you're able to truly see a rose for what it is. What I mean by that is that at some point, we define rose, right? We learn the word rose. 
we see a picture of it in a coloring book and we know a rose is going to be red for the most part, right? And then over time, we have experiences of what rose means, right? On Valentine's Day. Oh, but wait a second. I remember I gave a rose to a girlfriend once and it ended up really bad and we broke up on Valentine's Day. And now my belief system around rose changed. We experience life in that manner. When we're kids, we're in awe of everything we see. When we're in kids, we are curious about everything we see and we see it for what it is. But right around the age of seven years old, our whole perspective shifts because around that point, we pretty much have our definition and library of what everything is. We know what Rose is, we know what dog is, we know what cat is, we know what uncle is, we know what aunt is. The crazy thing is that your definitions are absolutely gonna be different than mine based on how you're taught, your community, your experiences. Regardless, everyone is living a truth based on their definitions of what life they've created. I'm saying all this to put out to you that maybe just maybe the way we see life is based on stories that we've told ourselves and we're not allowing ourselves to see things for what they are to see people for who they are, to see a rose for what it is, to see a dog, to see a friend, to see a lover. Because we hold on to stories that aren't necessarily true, they're expired. And it doesn't allow us to truly, truly experience the beauty of what people are, of what a rose is, of what a dog is, of what a kitchen knife is. The beauty is that it's all based on creation. It's all based on an in intuition and in inspiration of creation. So we see a laptop, right? And to me, it's an inanimate object, right? I can't fall in love with a laptop. I'm not gonna argue with a laptop, but I look at it and in my head I go, yes, laptop has many definitions for me. Laptop is, is my, my means to an end where I can put up notes, I can send emails, I can watch really funny YouTube videos, Netflix movies, and it served a purpose for me, but can you see laptop for what it is? Because what it is at its root was an inspiration. An inspiration at some point that was rooted in deep, deep creative self. And the point I'm trying to make is that that creative self, that one inspiration that whoever invented laptop and the design of this laptop had that inspiration, that inspiration comes from something so, so much deeper than we can ever imagine. That inspiration is the same wave that connects all of us. That inspiration is the same thing that's animating our existence. That inspiration is the same thing that's healing you with a cut. The same thing that's reversing cancer. That inspiration is essentially what many religions may call God. Many religions may call Muhammad, uh, one religion. Um, but regardless, it's all rooted in beauty. It's all rooted in creation. The vulnerability aspect for me has been so incredibly difficult. And I'm going to tie this all in, I promise. But the vulnerability aspect has been very incredibly difficult. And we make these adaptations, and I was talking about this earlier, when we're kids. And around seven, we have definitions of life, right? But we adapt, right, based on whatever experiences we have. Let's say a parent tells you at some point, it's not safe to cry. Well, your authenticity, your body's telling you to cry. Your emotions are telling you to cry. A child knows how to release emotions and they do it well. They throw tantrums, they shake, they breathe heavily. That's not a tantrum, that's their body taking over because their ego is not getting in the way of their healing. Well, at some point, when we're expressing that, right? And we know we're relying on our body and our body's intelligence is releasing that trauma because we're, we're really sad about something and we're yelling. At some point, a parent, and blessed our heart, right? working with the best information they have, saying that, no, we don't do that. We don't do that in public. We don't do that at home. Stop crying. Or even worse, boys don't cry, right? And this is a very, very important moment in our lives. Because in that moment, when we're crying and throwing that tantrum and releasing that energy and doing what the body knows how to do as children and not bringing in our ego, we're told, and this is for me an original sin, right? We're told that we cannot show that emotion, right? And there has to have been at some point in my life where that happened. I don't know if it was the way I grew up. I don't know if it was in school with a teacher, but at some point my adaptation 
to my authenticity of crying and releasing emotion and throwing a tantrum and, and being open and being expansive in my body and being vulnerable, I was told that it wasn't safe. That's not how we do things. And the, the power in a child's mind is that they know that for them to survive intuitively, deeply, for them to survive in that household or in that school, they must conform to whatever the norm is, right? And that norm is a standard that your parents set or your teacher set, but regardless, for the child to survive, they have to sacrifice their authenticity to be that which they need to survive. And that adaptation becomes part of our personality. That adaptation became part of my personality. It was so difficult for me to show emotion, to cry. It was so difficult for me to open my heart. It was so difficult, and, and I think about these things because I, you know, I, and I bring this all up and I'm having this conversation or putting this out there because I, I went into really deep meditation and I, I really saw a lot of inside shadows that I didn't want to look at. But that adaptation created a teenager, a young adult, a young doctor, and even in my 30s, a man who had so much trouble and hesitancy towards being vulnerable, towards being open. And the first real crack in my life was when I accepted that I can cry and it is safe to cry. And there's no story that's real anymore that I've told myself. At some point it was real when I was a kid and I needed to adapt right, for me to eat or for me to be accepted into the tribe. But at some point, I told myself that I can't cry. And it was interesting because last year, I've been open about this last year, I moved to the mountains and I did a full year of healing and of solitude and, and nature. And it was so healing. But it allowed me to release so much of these emotions that I've been holding in and really set a new standard for myself of what it means to be vulnerable. And that vulnerability and allowing myself to cry, it came out like... A, a, a river, a rapid river, a wild river of emotion. And, and to know that one can cry, I cried for 40 days straight, 40 days straight. And on the 41st day, I felt it all come out. And in that moment, I said, I will never ever again swallow my emotions if I need to show them. I'll never again swallow sadness. If I watch, even if I watch a movie and I get sad, I'm gonna allow myself to cry and be authentic authentic with my emotions and not, not let my ego say, no, 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 it's not safe to cry in this environment. It's an old story, but it's not safe to cry in this environment and holding back from it. The other part, and I really hope, and listen, if you're listening to this and you go, no, psh, I let emotion out easily, then beautiful for you. But hopefully there's something in here that you resonate with. And look, what I'm giving you today is my truth. And there is no one truth. The most dangerous thing you can have is a dogma and believe your truth is the truth. That's why we have religious wars. There's many truths. There's many experiences. There's many human creations, right? So please understand that what I'm sharing with you is my truth from my heart and full alignment with my soul in human form, coming out as words with the gifts I've been given to articulate. And if you resonate and any part of you resonates, then listen deeper. And if you don't, but you think someone else can, then send this to someone else who may. But back to it. Really, the biggest hurdle in my life has been vulnerability. And the, it's not just crying and showing emotion, because that's been really taken care of. But there was a massive shadow, and we all have shadows that we're hiding, and we don't want to look at. But I'll tell you, one of the bravest things you can do in your life is stand up straight, stand up tall, open your chest and say, yes, I'm ready to walk into this cave, right? With my shield and my sword and walk in and think you're going to fight that shadow and realize that shadow always just needed love. And in that moment, when you look at your shadow, you'll see that shadow is you. It's simply the child that's held back. It's the authenticity that you've been holding back and suffocating through an adaptation of a false belief and a false story that doesn't exist anymore. And that shadow, ironically, is your key to healing. If you suffer, like me, 
with gut issues that I developed in 2007. Consistent bloating, right? Consistent fullness, gassy, just not feeling good. Turning into psoriasis, right? And suffering with psoriasis since 2015. I am going to venture to say in so much confidence that if you're suffering with a disease in your body and it's not healing and you've tried one, all of the medications, two, all of the supplements, all of the diets, all of the biohacks, everything. I'm going to venture to say that the root cause of your disease that's not leaving you is based on that shadow that you're not looking at. And the moment you look at that shadow and remember your authenticity, you allow yourself to heal, you allow your body to heal. I'm actually in my work, uh, working in oncology, I've gotten many whispers of this truth through time. And being in my residency, I didn't really get to fully connect with my patients. I got to help them go through chemo and radiation with natural substances, which is great. But when I got out of that residency, I learned that there was way more parts to cancer than we were doing in that residency. So I started asking patients about their life, right? About what they're holding in, about who they haven't forgiven, about how they express themselves. And what I found is a few interesting things. Now, please don't quote me on this. And there's no research studies on this. But regardless, whatever I'm going to say is going to be for the better. I found that the patients who did all the best supplements, all the best therapies, right? They went through chemo, radiation, everything. They've gotten clear scans and the cancer came back. Many times the cancer came back for the people who didn't use the cancer diagnosis to change their life and to reconnect to their authenticity. Many times we have near-death experiences. Many times we have really deep traumas that force our brain to shift the plasticity and create a new belief system, a new experience. And sometimes it takes such dramatic things like a cancer diagnosis or a near-death experience or losing a loved one to really push yourself and your body, tell your brain, I had enough. I had enough of this limiting belief. I had enough of not being my authentic self. I had enough of not opening and living in love and being my highest self and sharing the love that I feel for myself with others. I had enough of not even feeling love for myself. And we have an opportunity with thing, with diseases, with something like cancer. So I found that the people who didn't utilize their cancer diagnosis to really make that change in their life of what their soul has been asking were a lot of the times the people who had that recurrence. And unfortunately, that was my mom who was diagnosed with breast cancer and I wish I had this understanding years ago, but diagnosed with breast cancer, but really, 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 and I, and, I, and, I, and I know this about my mom because it's in me. She had such a hard time expressing her emotions and speaking her truth and giving true words of affirmations to people and saying, you know what? This may be the last time I see you, but I love you. Or you know what? To the clerk at the cash register, you know what? I love your energy and you should know how, how great you are, you know? Or to the mailman, you know what? You look really happy doing what you do and I wanna give you some love and I wanna tell you I love you. She, like me, have been convinced at some point that it's not safe to be vulnerable like that. And after her cancer diagnosis, she didn't tap into that part of her. She just went back to living the closed off, non-authentic, non-expansive, non-expressive, not t telling people how much they, she loves them all the time, right? Not just being open with your words and your soul and just being one with the beauty of creation, right? Seeing a rose for what it is. And, and it came back for her and she passed away. And I'm, again, I'm not saying this is a cure for cancer, but I'm saying cancer and every disease and anything you're suffering with, it doesn't have to be cancer, can literally be eczema, it could be psoriasis, it could be SIBO, it could be heartburn. Everything is an opportunity because your body is speaking to you all the time. It's always telling you what it wants. And I am sure, I am positive that my gut issues and my psoriasis 
are simply rooted in the belief system and the story that I told myself that it is not safe to tell people how important they are to me. It's not safe for me to tell people how much I love them. It's not safe to be vulnerable because at some point it's going to challenge my survival. It's such a, it's such a false story that we live with. So I challenge you all, think about what stories you've told yourself. Think about if you're holding anything in. Think about if you're not being true to your authenticity. Think about when you were a child, what it was to be fully open and curious and flowing through life and seeing a bee for what it is, seeing a tree for what it is, without any words, without even naming it as a tree and truly experiencing it for what it is. I challenge you to think back to that time in your life. And if that is part of your life and you can tap into it, understand that it never left. And the very things that are holding you back are illusions. They're false, they're mirages, they're stories, and they're not rooted in anything but the same feedback loop that you've been telling yourself over and over. And I'm challenging you to break that feedback loop and allow yourself to be vulnerable and allow yourself to be open. Allow yourself to tell your dad you love him, to tell your brother or sister you love him, to tell your partner you love them, to tell your friends you love them, right? Life is short, can end tomorrow. But the power in expressing your truest, highest, most authentic self without fear and living in love will heal the world tomorrow if we all did it. So there you go. My knowledge bomb on love, authenticity, alignment, vulnerability. You all have this within you. It's not within reach. You don't need to climb a mountain, right? You don't need to do a retreat. You don't need anything. You don't need a teacher. You just need to understand that you've been telling yourself a story that's not true. And take that step, that, dis that uncomfortable step that's really hard in the beginning, but open up yourself, expand yourself, fall in love with yourself, fall in love with others, fall in love with everyone. Tell people they're great. Tell people they're wonderful. I love my crew. You guys are amazing. I love my producer. You guys are amazing. And I love you all. Thank you for listening to The Knowledge Bomb. All right, everyone, today's special guest, a friend of mine. Listen, I went into this clinic over here in Los Angeles and I get an x-ray and they tell me that I have a weak tongue and I'm trying to figure out how I have a weak tongue and how it's affecting my sleep. Dr. Sarush Zaghi is an ENT sleep surgeon and he's incredible at what he does. And I want him to drop some information because a lot of it you may have never heard before, but can be absolutely connected to your health and your children's health. So doc, thank you for making your way to Santa Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a, such a privilege to be here in your studio yeah. and uh, your incredible team here. I had no idea how much goes into these videos that you guys produce. Yeah, we have a great team here. It's, it's amazing. And then, you know, I just admired all the great content that you put out for, for the, for the, for the uh, families and mm -hmm. the patients out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, me as an ENT here in the community, um, I come from a very academic background. I went to Harvard Medical School, UCLA mm -hmm. and residency, Stanford sleep surgery. So I was really trained to look at the books and the literature. But, uh, you know, in doing that, you become kind of ingrained in a certain dogma. And it's hard to kind of take a step back and look at things in another way. And so what really impressed me uh, about, about your perspective was just something as simple as like acid reflux. Yeah. Where the medical community is just so ingrained to us as medical doctors, we look for a medicine solution to put, you know, proton pump inhibitors mm -hmm. to, to reduce it. And then for you to come and say, no, you know, the problem is something totally different. It's not that you're producing too much acid. Mm -hmm. It's a compensation. Looking at the root causes really inspired me. And so that's why I had so much respect. And I said, hey, if I can come and, you know, help your audience understand a thing or two about sleep and breathing and how that can affect their quality of life and, you know, help them uh, overcome other parts of, of a health and disease, I'd love to do that. Likewise. And I appreciate that within you because sometimes it's hard for me to, to bridge the gap between fully academic, here is exactly how it is, and here's what works, and here's how we know the algorithm goes, and if it doesn't work, we give this. But to be open, um, especially with all the academic work you've done, it's like, it's awesome to see. So thank you for coming here. But tell us a little bit about the work you do. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, um, you know, I trained as an ENT, ear, nose, throat, and doctor. Uh, and during residency, I got inspired by 
by breathing and, and by sleep. And there's a field called sleep and breathing. Um, uh, and so I went on to do a fellowship at Stanford. And so now what I do is I take care of, of patients of all ages, uh, from infants to adolescents, you know, teenagers, older adults, anybody who has a problem with sleep, anybody who has a problem with breathing from the nose all the way down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when, when you're looking at problems, you're also looking not only at fixing the problems, but also preventing. And so a lot of the prevention comes from early intervention in kids for things like uh, tongue mobility, tongue posture, chewing and swallowing, because it turns out the way that you chew and swallow affects the way that the teeth develop and the way that the teeth develop affects the way that the jaw develops mm -hmm. and the way the jaw develops affects the airway. And the way that your airway develops affects the way that you sleep and breathe throughout the night. And if you're not breathing well, you're not sleeping well, your body goes into fight or flight mode, predominance is sympathetic tone, fight or flight. And then you get these kids who present with ADHD kind of symptoms, but really they're just sympathetically overdriven. And um, you get uh, other issues when they're not sleeping well, like decreased growth hormone during stage three sleep. So now they have impaired immune function, uh, growth retardations, and they get less REM sleep. And, um, and when they have these issues with sleep and breathing, they can get other problems like large tonsils, high arch palates that further perpetuates the problem. And the studies now show that you know these kids who aren't breathing well, it, it's affecting the way their brain development, their cortical gray matter, uh, and it's just it just perpetuates. So if we can address this early, understanding that breathing is the beginning when it comes to sleep and airway health, uh, we can do a lot of good for a lot of people. It's incredible that we do a lot of the downstream work, right? We see the symptoms in the body of poor sleep based on some of those issues that we spoke about that you talked about upstream. But then we give the medicine and medication mm -hmm. for that. Right. And so sort of the work, as I'm understanding, is you're doing is you're really at the root right on the front lines, making sure early on to help with development so that this child can actually reach their full yeah. developmental potential. Absolutely. So, you know, m m the majority of my training was in adults, actually, figuring out what can we do with patients who have severe obstructive sleep apnea, these big surgeries, these big interventions. But then my mentor, Dr. Christian Guimino, who invented the concept of obstructive sleep apnea, who invented the sleep study as we know it, who invented the term upper airway resistance syndrome. Towards the end of his career, he, you know, as one of his students, he looked at me and said, you know, it's great that we can do all these things to treat the problem, but really what we need to do is look at the younger population to identify how we can prevent these wow. from, from setting on. And so he really inspired me to kind of take that look. And so when I graduated from fellowship, I really kind of ran with that. Uh, and it's great to be able to see the kids and the adults because they're so similar. You can watch the kids like growing up into that adult mm -hmm. and it's so rewarding. You have to nip it in the bud. Family, uh, I, just, I just had a kid. He, he broke his nose and he just couldn't breathe out of his nose mm -hmm. no matter what. Saline rinses and Flonase, things like that. Eight years old, eight years old. And so I did a, a, a surgery for him. I, I, I fixed his deviated septum. And parents are coming back like he can breathe. He stopped snoring. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's so much more refreshed. The kid's like, I feel a lot better. Yeah. Dad's like, you changed his life. And I know that I did. Because when, when you're not breathing through the nose, when you're breathing through the mouth, it changes the position of the tongue in the mouth. Okay, The natural position for the tongue is high in the roof of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, And when your tongue is high in the roof of the mouth, you can only breathe through your nose. Mm -hmm. When you mouth breathe, the tongue goes low. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to mouth breathe, the tongue low. There are also other things that cause low tongue posture, like tongue ties, high arch palate, tone issues, a whole host of things that cause low tongue posture. Now, when the tongue is low, it doesn't do a good job of expanding the upper jaw. When the tongue is high, all that force goes on the upper teeth. It pushes it out and forward. When the tongue is low, it makes the mandible drop down, the upper jaw grows down, and it physically changes the structure of the face. Mm -hmm. And as the lower jaw goes down, can potentially obstruct right, the airway, right. they bring their head and neck forward, and now they're getting neck and shoulder tension, now they're getting headaches, clenching and grinding. And it turns out that when the tongue is low and they try to sleep on their back, Mm -hmm. they choke on their tongue. Mm -hmm. So now they have to sleep in odd positions, sleep on their stomach, sleep on their side, 
all these weird con uh, contortions just to be able to make it through the night. Wow. That's incredible to think about because <clears throat> I remember me personally in my, man, I had so much orthodontic work, um, but essentially they had to remove uh, two molars on the top and bottom mm -hmm. and my, my palate was narrow. And I remember I had really poor jaw development when I was, I mean, like seventh grade. And um, that you could just see there was a, what's the dental term for it? There's a mandible retracted and- Okay. Yeah, it's, it's and, and my breathing was horrible. Totally. That I was actually um, diagnosed with some sort of asthma. I think it was wow. exercise induced asthma. Got it. But it's interesting because through the orthodontic work, I started breathing better mm -hmm. as my palate expanded. And actually it was right when I had the palate expander with the key, mm -hmm. which I remember I hated uh -huh. turning that key. It was always really sore. But- you can look at a child and know that they're not breathing well because of the way their jaw has formed, 100%. right? Their jaw and their eyes. Okay. They could be wearing a mask and I can still see it in their eyes. So what is? So what are some of the physical, I know you mentioned the, yeah. the deviated mandible. So the characteristic is what we call vertical growth. The face grows downwards, okay, instead of wide, all right? Because when the tongue is up, it'll push the face to be more square. So if someone has a really V-shaped kind of face, mm -hmm. That's like the first telltale sign. You can look at the teeth. The teeth will be crowded, okay? Uh, you look inside the mouth. The upper roof should be nice and wide, but it'll be more like a V. Mm -hmm. uh, and then even if you just look at their eyes, okay, the whole mid face kind of sinks down, right? okay? And even if they're wearing a mask you can't see, one little clue is if you're seeing like the whites of the eye, mm -hmm. because it turns out that the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose, right? So that's why when they expand the roof of the mouth, the floor of the nose widened. Right. Okay. But the same thing goes for the maxilla. All right. The maxilla, which is a nasal capsule. Okay. The roof of the nose is the floor of the orbit. Mm -hmm. So when this kind of sinks down, the eyes kind of sink down and particularly the lateral canthus. So sometimes the lateral canthus is lower. Right. You can see the whites of the eyes. You can mm -hmm. see the bags underneath the eyes. And it's a telltale sign that they're having underdeveloped maxillofacial skeleton. Wow. And even more so, if you see that blue veins that are kind of popping out here, that's a sign that they're mouth breathing as well. It's pretty incredible because there's a lot of people right now, they're like, oh my God, that's my kid. Yeah. That's my kid. It's exactly totally. the, the look. And um, I have a friend, Dr. Stephen Lin, who you uh -huh. know, he was on this show years ago. Uh, he put up a picture of what it looks like. And I remember I, I was like, yes. Like totally. there was kids in my school who looked exactly like this. Um, and I always wondered what that was. And that's what it was. Yeah, that's it was exactly like, right. So what is, you mentioned tongue ties. Uh -huh. um, is it, is, or do some children have sh tongue ties, born with tongue ties, some are not. Totally. S some stronger tongues, some weaker tongues. Like, you what know, is it? Absolutely. So so tongue tie is a condition in which the tongue is physically tethered to the floor of the mouth. And tongue tie is really 10% at most of the reasons for all these things. The, the majority of the reasons why the faces develop the way that they do is because of function, the way the tongue functions and the way the teeth function in terms of chewing and swallowing, okay? The, the muscles and the bones respond to the forces that are put on them, okay? So when the tongue is high, it's gonna put a force that's gonna kind of expand, right, for the upper jaw. And then for the teeth, you said you had to have your molars out, yeah. right? It all comes down to proper chewing, okay? Because when, when you have tongue tie problems or when you're mouth breathing, it's very difficult to do complete co closed mouth chewing on the back molars. You'll gag on something, right? Because mm -hmm. you're trying to mouth breathe and, and chew eat, with it, yeah. okay? So you don't want to choke on the food that you're eating. So you bring your head forward, you chew only on the front, mm -hmm. and you might prefer soft foods, mushy foods, instead of like like meats and, and real real hard substances that really require those forces. Right. But if you look at, uh, you know, ancestral norms, okay, where, uh, you know, they had to go and get things off the bush and eat real meats and things like that, and they would chew, they have the full complement of teeth, including their wisdom teeth, because their jaws have developed as a response to the, the masticatory forces, okay? So when I see a kid who has crowding, I know that they're not chewing right. I know that they're not swallowing right. And when they're not chewing right, they're not swallowing right, the tongue sits low, they're not going to be sleeping right. Mm. It's all like a big circle uh, that one thing leads leads to the Yeah, next. yeah. It's a huge, it's like a chain. It's crazy. It's like a chain reaction. So 
the proper way for a child to eat early on is with their mouth closed, Absolutely. utilizing their molars to masticate. Yeah. Right? Uh, but you can tell if they're compensating, if they're, like you said, their head is forward and they're using if, their if they're, if they're like kind of hunched forward. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but then the other thing is if they're only chewing on one side. Right? Oh, wow. If you only chew on one side, you'll see the face shift like this. Interesting. It's, uh, it's incredible. So these kids came in where one side is nice wide and the other side is long because wow. they're only chewing on one side. And they might be chewing on one side because they have a narrow arch and they have a crossbite, so their teeth only touch on one side. Mm-hmm. Or it could be they have a tongue tie, so they can't move the food back and forth. So you chew five times on this side, move it over, chew on that side, wow. move it back and forth is the ideal way to chew. But if you're only chewing on one side, maybe you had like a dental infection or a yeah. cavity, you're trying to avoid that side, that starts to shift the way that the face is. And as the face shifts, okay, you're going to have like a crooked horizontal visual access. So to make up for it, you rotate your head. And now you get neck and shoulder strains and you get other issues. And so the the head is the head is crooked, but then the neck kind of makes up for it. And so they come in kind of like an exacerbated version of that. Isn't, isn't it crazy how a child isn't consciously thinking about, let me turn my neck to the side right. to, to straighten out my vision. It's sort of like the body is just like, here's how we breathe better. Here's how we see better. Here's how we chew better. It's just these compensation it's fundamental, mechanisms. right? It's, it's fundamental evolutionary mechanism, right? You got to breathe. You got you got to maintain that visual access, yeah. Uh, in order to function, right? Yeah, yeah. And and right. and the body's like, oh well, let me take over now. And you see these compensation mechanisms. It's pretty exactly wild right. to see. Yeah. So and it's so fun. We take a step back, right? And you're not just throwing a medicine at the problem. Not just putting some spray in the nose. You're saying, hey, what happened here? Mm-hmm. And get to the root causes of things. So that's that's what I'm proud of. I'm the first ENT clinic in the country that has myofunctional therapy. Uh, we now have seven myofunctional therapies who work just in my clinic, and we're developing something called uh, the Breathe Myo Hub, in which it's it's virtual support for really anyone in the country or in the world. They can reach in. We have these excellent, highly trained therapists who've gone through rigorous training with us at the Breathe Institute, who can start to screen individuals so that we can really satisfy the demand. Wow. And I've been there. I've been to the one in Westwood, the Breathe Institute, and um I'm going to talk about my experience. Now. Thank you so much. And, and 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 because from the adult side, there's a lot of people who are listening, right? Full adults, and they go, "Okay, but what about me? Like now we know about the kids. Do I have any issues?" So I come in, and I meet you, and uh, you put some some sort of uh, dye or uh-huh, not dye in my uh-huh. mouth, just markers to see how I'm biting, uh-huh. right? And um, and correct me sure. if I'm missing a step here. You did the a- a- analysis of my mouth, uh-huh. checked, checked my, told me to close, looked at my tongue, made me move it around. And then we did the x-ray. And then you were reading over the x-ray. I took, actually put this on Instagram. I remember that. People, remember people that. were like, what is going on? I can't believe that. But um, you saw my tongue was sort of like just falling back uh-huh. a little bit. And you're like, you have a weak tongue, man. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I have a weak tongue. What do you mean? Like, uh, how do I exercise my tongue? Little did I know, right after I talked to one of the therapists and I, I went home with a bunch of exercises Amazing. that I've been working in my car and moving my tongue around. That's awesome. um, but that's been really helpful actually at helping me breathe. So what was happening, my chief complaint was I came to you and I said, you know, middle of the night, I, I wake up and I'm like anxious. And it c- kind of happened over the past year developed before that. And I wake up anxious and I'd like kind of sometimes sit up or like get out of my bed and I'm like... And it's because I had that sympathetic activation because mm-hmm. my body thought I was choking, but it hasn't happened since actually. Amazing. Just by, but that's just by exercises. Wow. But t- tell me, an adult. How, how, how it works, right? Yeah. So so when you don't, it's, it, with, the, with the muscles of the body, like, use it or lose it, right? Yeah. If you sat in a bed for two weeks, your muscles would, would decay, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so same thing with your tongue. If you're not using your tongue, if it's just sitting low in your mouth, it's going to get weak. It's going to start to fasciculate. You're going to barely be able to lift it up let alone keep the tongue entirely on the roof of the mouth mm-hmm. all throughout the night. And now you need the tongue to be pressed up against the roof of the mouth. It makes like a negative suction cup effect, so it kind of holds on, all right? So when you're sleeping, the tongue has something to kind of lever against, mm-hmm. which is the roof of the mouth. Now, if you don't have that and the tongue is low, the tongue doesn't really have anything to lever against, okay? And it's just like a little weak piece of muscle that's stuck. And as you go from light to deep sleep, all the muscle in the body relax, the tongue relaxes, and it can choke you. Yeah, and that's what was happening. And then, and then the body alerts you. You get acid reflux. The reflux comes up. It irritates your nose. You get nasal congestion. You feel nauseous. You feel like migraines. You clench and grind as a result, and all these downstream consequences. And how many people are saying that? They're like, oh, my God, I wake up with heartburn all the time without yeah, even knowing the right. mechanisms behind it. Because you're not breathing. 
and then you suddenly gasp. Yeah. And then you're pulling up all that acid and yeah. stomach contents up. They've even shown it even gets even up to your ears sometimes. Whoa. And and that's exactly what was happening because I felt like I would be like I feel right. myself kind of like choking, and that's exactly what it was. The tongue was just falling back. Um, so I've actually been consciously, you know, especially when I'm driving, for some reason, it's just me and my tongue when I drive in the music. And I, I, I make sure that I'm putting my tongue up, creating a suction. Unfortunately, my uh, the roof of my mouth isn't wide enough to accommodate my whole mm-hmm, tongue, mm-hmm. which we talked about a little bit. But um, it's been better. What else has been helping for me is the mouth tape. Do you like mouth tape? Is it? Is it? How do you feel about it? Is it something- absolutely so? That's one of the first steps when we're screening for uh, these problems with sleep uh, and breathing. We've actually we so in our clinic, we're not only a clinic that does medical care, but we're also a research institute that produces bodies of knowledge uh, and evidence to support these protocols. And we're also a teaching institute, so other doctors come, they learn from our protocols. So we've recently developed something called the Fairest Six, and I'd love to share this. Uh, this little figure and graph and publication with you and your your viewers, yeah, yeah. and so it looks. It, it talks about six things to look for in terms of you know figuring out does my child have an issue. The first thing is is can you breathe through your nose exclusively for three minutes? And the way that we test that is with mouth tape. So we just put a piece of tape over the mouth. If you don't have tape, you can use like a little uh, put a little piece of paper between the lips. Mm-hmm. Okay, and see, can you breathe through your nose for three minutes? If you can, that's fantastic. If you can't, then we talk about cleaning your nose. And so uh, there's there's mechanisms out there like the neti pot and things like that. Mm. Uh, we have something called breathe wash. And so it's actually salt water, a bicarbonate, a little bit of baby shampoo that goes in and it just cleans out the nose, gets out all the mucus, gets out all the bacterial biofilms inside the nose. That's cool. Yeah, and people really like it. It's like really refreshing. And then it opens it up. Once your nose is open, we tell them, all right, put your tongue to the roof of the mouth, keep your lips together, and try to breathe through your nose for three minutes. Once you've done it for three minutes, go five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30 minutes, wow. and then you can go overnight. And there's different kinds of mouth tape that you can use. You can just use 3M micropore tape straight across. You can go up and down. There's like Somnifix with a little strip. That's the one I have. Uh, for kids, some parents are afraid of covering the lips, so there's myo tape. Uh, that goes all the way around the lips and it kind of squeezes lips together. Because mm-hmm. what happens when you're a mouth breather is not only the tongue gets weak, the lips get weak too. So right. now it's hard to keep your mouth even closed. Mm-hmm. So just just practicing with the tape reinforces it and it engages the muscle tone. And over time, it gets easier and easier to the point that you don't need to use the tape. Wow. So the tape is kind of like a brace to help you establish nasal breathing. And so that's the first thing of the Ferris Six, and we can talk about the other ones too. Yeah. So I'll say something about the mouth tape. Um, I usually keep it on all night, but one night I remember it came off or I took it off, but I, I woke up and, and I remember consciously my first thought was my mouth is completely shut. Like it, the mouth tape is still there. Like Amazing. it's wild. It's, it's trained my muscles in my mouth to, to stay shut even mm-hmm. without it. So the other day... Um, I was feeling under the weather, and um, I, I didn't I didn't want to shut my mouth because in case I needed to mouth breathe because I couldn't my, my nose was stuffed up, but my mouth my mouth was completely shut. I love it. And I found that my tongue was at best as as best as it could be on the roof of my mouth. So I was like, I really trained mm-hmm. my body. And what I did notice symptomatically or a sign was the the dark spots under my eyes. They went away. Amazing. And I and I had them like. Since my twenties, I was wow. like, "Why do I have dark spots under my yeah. eyes?" I was thinking food allergies, and then I was thinking mold, maybe. But it was really just that amazing. The mouth it. breathing, the low tongue posture. It's called venous pooling, uh, and it's a sign of like inflammation. Uh, and it turns out that when you're breathing through the nose, there's something called nitric oxide that's developed in the sinuses, and the pressure of the tongue on the roof of the mouth actually helps the flow of the blood and prevents that inflammation and the, and the veins from kind of uh, dilating and, and showing up there. So uh, so this, the purple, is a sign of inflammation. All right? Wow. And mouth breathing causes inflammation. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure you talk about in your, your courses, like foods you can eat to reduce inflammation and things you can do, but mm-hmm. like breathing, right? Mm-hmm. Breathing through the nose, breathing slowly and comfortably through the nose uh, changes the bacteria in your mouth, it, it uh, upregulates the production of nitric oxide. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it helps stimulate the flow of blood through the maxilla um, to uh, to reduce inflammation. How amazing. Yeah. And I was thinking about, that's actually where a lot of my interest has been, is how mouth breathing changes the oral microbiome. 
and what's the consequence of that in your gut microbiome mm -hmm. and the rest of your body and cavities, mm -hmm. right? And inflammation mm -hmm. in the mouth. It's pretty incredible to me because what I keep going back to is this chain that you're painting. It's like- Right, the mouth breathing causes dry mouth. Mm -hmm. The dry mouth is a decrease in saliva. The saliva is meant there to maintain a certain pH balance inside your mouth. Mm -hmm. It has antibacterial properties, antifungal properties, and viral properties, the saliva does. And when you don't have that saliva, a different kind of bacteria takes over. It's the bacteria that produces inflammation yeah. on your teeth, on your gums, on your tonsils, in your airway, and so on. I always used to mouth breathe. And then thinking about when I was asleep, my mouth would be open. I had cavities so much when I was a kid. And and I remember they changed my, my parents changed my diet. They, they took sugars away and they would still get cavities. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it was rooted in that mouth breathing mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, so what, what are some other... Um, oh, things the, to look for. Yeah, yeah things no, to the look six for. things, right? Yes. So the first one is, can you breathe through the nose for three minutes, all right? And if you can breathe for three minutes, take it to 10 minutes, take it to 30 minutes. Easy one to do. If you can't breathe through your nose, clean your nose, try the mouth taping. If you still can't breathe through your nose, then you come see an ET doctor, okay? 95% of people will be able to figure it out, 5% won't. The next thing to look for are signs of a change to the facial growth and development. Now, when we did our study, we looked at 15 different characteristics in, uh, in terms of the teeth, like it was a meso, it's a dolicofacial, long, and we came up with something that's very easy for families to pick up on their own. All you have to do is ask them to close the lips and see whether or not you have what's called mentalis strain. So you look at this muscle here, the mentalis muscle, and in kids who have excessive vertical growth or who have a deficiency in the mandible growth or oral incompetence or whatever reason, this muscle will strain, okay? So you just ask them, close your lips, and if you see like a real dimpling here, it's probably a sign based on our research that there's some problem with the teeth underlying it, all right? Um, and so that's the second thing to look for. The third thing to look for are large tonsils. Tonsils are these two little things in the back of the throat. So you have the uvula in the middle and the tonsils on the side. Usually the tonsils should occupy less than 50% of the airway, should occupy about 25%. If it's going beyond the 50% mark and occupying the midline, that can be a significant problem that causes uh, you know, sleep disturbances. It, it's a sign of inflammation in the body. It's a sign of airway obstruction. Uh, then we talk about tongue tie, whether or not you can lift up your tongue or whether it's tethered to the floor of the mouth. You should be able to lift up your tongue more than 50% of the maximum mouth opening. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at high arch palate. So you know the, the, the palate, if it's like a V-shaped or U-shaped, and then we look for signs of dental grinding so and dental wear. So we look at the teeth structures. You should have the whole enamel intact. But if you're kind of eroding through, you're, you're exposing the dentin or, or you know, there's abfractions and there's like problem with the teeth, that's another sign. So wow. those, so are, those are the six are signs. Yeah. The six signs that if, if you're mouth breathing? Uh, those are signs to look forward for, for, for mouth breathing and uh, sleep disordered breathing. Sleep disordered yeah, breathing. It's called the fairest six. We'll, we'll, pr we'll provide a link so everyone can see this nice little thing that. that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send that over and you know the whole audience will be able to click on it and yeah. go through the assessment themselves. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing that you can do this, right? Uh, and that, that's what we're developing, right? Yeah. Because, because traditionally it said you have to get like a sleep study in the lab yeah. and you know just going to the lab, get a sleep study can cost two to $5,000 and then that's just looking for sleep apnea. But we're looking for the whole spectrum, right? Mouth breathing, noisy breathing, snoring. And if even if it's not a breathing issue, your tongue is up, well, or it's not a breathing issue. We want to know about tongue posture, how you're chewing, how you're swallowing. Mm -hmm. And if there is a problem with any of these, then what we try to do is we try to come up with the root cause assessment, what's causing this problem, and what are the minimal things that we can do in terms of exercises and breathing re-education and chewing and swallowing education to get you on your way. Mm -hmm. And they're so easy to do. Yeah, they're you can so do easy. it at home. Work, For a month or two, you work with a kid, you could change their life. For the rest of their life. For the rest of their life. Even their physical yeah. appearance, the rest of their Absolutely. life. Absolutely. It's, it's pretty so amazing. crazy. And it's good for children and adults. Yeah. I had uh, I had like a, a like a old like a forty year old lady come to me, and uh, it changed her life in terms of neck and shoulder tension. Mm -hmm. She brought her eighty year old uh, grandmother next time, wow. and even at eighty years old, you can get these things treated. It's never too late. It, it, it's incredible because you can you sort of accommodate too with your posture, mm -hmm. right? It, it, in many ways, your neck goes forward, your posture is all slumped up, but really, like with your chin going back and your posture better, you feel even that from the psychosomatic point is the confidence, right? You're just Absolutely. walking around with more confidence, right? You're breathing totally. better. 
you feel more energized, athletic. You you can take on the world if you're getting all these things corrected, pretty much. That's 100%. The and even if I tell the parents, even if your kid's doing well, even if he's an A student, even if he's an excellent uh, you know, soccer player, basketball yeah. player, baseball player, imagine the difference that you could do, the extra advantage you can have between nasal and mouth breathing alone, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, just look at the Olympics and you can see that the athletes who are doing the sprints and who are winning the gold medals, they're nasal breathers mm-hmm. uh, to really propel them forward. So even if you're high functioning, you got to wonder how much better could you function if your sleep was that much better? Yeah, 100%. And um, when you mentioned sleep apnea, would you say that the majority of sleep apnea is caused with disordered breathing from the mouth and not not nasal breathing? So, or? so sleep apnea is a late stage form of the uh, sleep and breathing issues, okay? So usually starts with mouth breathing. It causes inflammation, causes noisy breathing. They present with a lot of arousals. Sleep apnea is a late stage where the airway is obstructed and you have the the, the brain changes, the arousability changes that doesn't allow you to respond. So your body's trying to adapt, trying to wake up, do everything you can to avoid the not breathing, the apnea. Once you have apnea, you have a blockage and an inability to wake up and compensate for it. Mm. So it's both of those things that you need to have the sleep apnea. So you're hyper aroused for a while. You're hyper aroused for a while. And then it's like an alarm going off, right? The alarm gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And then you become less and less responsive to it. Wow. And that's what happens with sleep apnea. That's what happens with sleep apnea. So it's increased airway obstruction and decreased cortical arousability. Okay. So the smoke is getting worse and your response to the alarm is getting less. And that's why they have the CPAP. And that's that and that point you don't respond. So you need something else to breathe for you. To breathe for you. Wow. Wow. And and is this and and people pass away from sleep apnea? You can pass away. There's a mortality risk. It's it's about a 30% 15 year mortality risk. Wow. Incredible. And and then and then to just to go back yeah, to, to swallowing and chewing, um, we can see kids chewing on the right side or the left side or you with can their see incisors, in their face. and you see it in their face. We should be chewing both sides. Both sides. You should have symmetry, right? Symmetry. And and then for swallowing, it's the front of the tongue up, back of the tongue up, and push the food down. You don't mm-hmm. want to be pushing your tongue out when you swallow. Okay. You don't want to be swallowing like this. And some kids do. Yeah, they have a tongue thrust, immature, low resting tongue position swallow. Instead, you want to swallow the tongue up. Okay. So outside of the breathing, right, the respiratory pathway, do you see any other presentations connected to disordered breathing? Yeah. So one thing that you see is the compensations to avoid the disordered breathing. So there's a lot of people who uh, don't have any problems with sleep apnea, right? but they, they hold themselves like this, mm-hmm. with their tongue up and their head forward because they may have a tongue tie issue. And if they were to relax, the tongue would drop and block their airway. So they've gotten really tight. So they'll present as neck and shoulder tension or fascia tension. And so we release these individuals, their bodies open up, they have improved mobility, they yeah. do less clenching and grinding. And it's really rewarding to be able to help them as well. Interesting. Interesting yes, because so I, really I, you is. say this, but I am like thinking of people that I've seen or in, in my life mm-hmm. who who have the same who have the same presentation, uh-huh. and it, and it's 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 crazy to see again the body. It's a fight or flight presentation, yeah. right? Yeah, it's not like a relaxed, inviting. It's it's a defensive mode when you're in like this. Yeah, and and yet those are the same people who go. I I get massages all the time, and I don't right. know why. I, I just keep getting tight in my chest and my shoulders, and I'm all crunched up over here totally you got to find the root cause right and that's the root cause you got to find the root cause you oh, find the root amazing cause. so um for people listening and viewing they they're thinking about their kid and they go i actually did this verbal mm-hmm. test and, and assessment totally my kid falls in there i fall in there what do we do now okay we, we, we'd love to be able to support uh, the families um you know i i myself am, am an ent doctor here in westwood uh, out of the breathe institute but like i said we're also an educational f- facility and we've now trained like a whole group of therapists throughout the country so we have something that's called the breathe myo hub it's called help you breathe hub and uh, parents will reach out where are you from what age is your child or, or what adult or what what issues are you having? It comes to a central place and we'll, we'll help find you someone. Oh, cool. In your area cool. who can help take care of your issues. And it's not just anyone. It's people that we highly trust who continually study with us, who contribute to our research and are expanding knowledge in this area. And that's expanding to around the country. This so. is now around the country. Okay, great. If I'm calling yeah. from Kansas. Throughout the world even. 
Uh, we wow. even have it throughout the world. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. different time zones. I get people, someone from like, uh, I want to say like Hungary or Belgium, mm -hmm. Canada, uh, Chile. I mean, all over the world. Amazing. We're able to support. And any other resources that we can look forward to? Are you coming uh, have, out with anything? Yeah, so I have a whole host of lectures on my website for people who just want to learn a little bit more yeah. and be a little bit more exposed to these concepts, see the research. If you go to zoggymd.com slash lecture files, um, you'll be able to kind of see my presentations and kind of keep up on all the research that we're doing and just to get the word out there so we can help all these families. Amazing stuff. And then the Breathe Institute, that's the handle on Instagram, right? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Yeah. When I come back there, I'm going to do a few stories. Sounds great. Um, Can't wait. And, and then in the in the future, we got to have you back here. I would love that. I have such about. a great time. You have yeah. such a beautiful facility here. Yeah. yeah. I'll definitely be back. I appreciate your work, man. Like, it's, it's, you're doing like root cause work That's and that really I right. always like hold doctors like that in high acclaim for me because I'm like, you guys are doing it. Like, and this and, is and you know what? Thank you for drawing attention to, to all these different resources and bringing them to one uh, space for the viewers to, to learn and appreciate. It's, appreciate it's really amazing. You got heal thyself, right? Yeah. Heal thyself. I love that, man. It, it's I love all that. love. All right. Thank you, doc. Okay. You got it, my friend. Thank you.